All right. Uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, it's been a wonderful day. This is the last session, which I'm very excited for. Um, so, you know, this session is going to be focused on what do we know empirically about the relationship between climate or meteorological variables that are related to climate uh, and aspects of the economy that either describe the macro economy or might plausibly be inputs to things that are part of the macro economy. Um, and I think this session, I mean, just for context, there was a, you know, a raft of research that was done in the 90s and the early 2000s, helping us all think theoretically about climate change as an economic problem, you know, thinking about contributions of Bill Nordhaus and Nicholas Stern and Marty Weitzman. These were all theoretical models that were sort of describing the nature of the problem, sort of qualitatively, but using mathematical models. Uh, but very little of those models were calibrated to sort of real world data. And so there's been since then something of a revolution in terms of measurement, measuring these types of relationships. And that's what uh, we're gonna hear about right now. I think the challenge to this audience is to ask the question, how do we take those measurements and integrate them into the models that we're using for these types of decision-making purposes? So um, I'll get out of the way. Uh, Marshall Burke is our first speaker. Marshall's an associate professor of global environmental policy at the Dora School of Sustainability at Stanford. Uh, and he's the deputy director at the Center for Food Security and the Environment. Um, and he, his research focuses on social and economic impacts of environmental change and measuring the, and understanding the economic livelihoods uh, across the global landscape. So Marshall, you have 10 minutes and I'll interrupt you at eight. Great, thanks a lot, Saul. Thanks uh, for the invitation to be here. Um, sorry to be remote. Um, you guys are all wearing ties, so being remote, and as a Californian means I don't have to wear a tie, uh, which is wonderful. Um, so I'll start us off here uh, thinking again, as Saul mentioned about data-driven estimates, really focused on the physical climate risk. So this will be on the physical side, now on the transition side. Um, looking at both the US and globally, we're gonna use some global data and then try to think about what those data mean for the US uh, specifically. So I can't control the slides, if, uh, but next slide. Thanks. Okay, so two basic approaches that you're gonna see uh, between me and, and Tama uh, and Jeremy, I believe. Um, uh, the first and the one I'm not gonna do is, uh, is bottom up or, or what is sometimes called the enumerative approach. So this is really nice. It uses trusted microdata. We can go sector by sector and get really high quality causal estimates of climate impacts in different sectors. So in mortality and agriculture uh, in labor supply. Uh, and, and, and these are great. Again, high quality microdata, really strong econometrics, great estimates. Um, so those are the pluses. Uh, a challenge in these, especially when you're trying to have them inform the sort of modeling exercises that we saw before, or think about broader sort of aggregate economic impacts, uh, you need to be able to measure things across all sectors. So you need to be able to enumerate measurement in all the sectors that we care about that contribute to economic output. Uh, and then you need to be able to somehow integrate these uh, estimates, right? So it's the integration of many sort of partial equilibrium estimates over sectors and across space, and, and that can be uh, challenging. Uh, next slide. Uh, so uh, uh, opposite approach, and what I'm going to walk you through today is what we call a top-down approach. So instead of enumerating uh, impact sector by sector and adding them up, we're going to let the economy add things up for us and study the aggregate uh, output of, of that adding up. So looking at something like GDP, which indeed is what we'll look at. Uh, what's nice about this is the adding up is done for you. So um, that's nice. Uh, an added feature is that at least some of the costs and benefits of, of adaptive measures, so things like sector reallocation that you might be worried about, are going to be embedded at least to some extent in these measures. So that's nice. So the, the adding up is done. Some of the adaptations are embedded. Um, but there's challenges too. Uh, number one, we don't have a ton of GDP data, right? Um, especially if you limit to an individual country. Uh, and so that's why we're going to use global data. Um, and maybe more importantly, you're going to miss all that you care about uh, that are not in GDP. And this has already come up. It will come up again, I assume, in Tamas remarks, things like uh, how we value uh, lives lost due to a changing climate. So that's really important when we think about these impacts. Uh, that said, we're going to see how far we can push the GDP data um, in what follows. So next slide. Okay, so I, I, I'm not going to take you through the econometrics. Happy to talk about that more if, if folks are interested. Um, really what the econometrics boil down to is the following thought experiment. So in a year that is hotter than average, 
Um, does the U.S. economy or any economy that we're going to look at, does it grow faster or slower in that year and in subsequent years? Okay, so again, take a year that's hotter than average. Look to see, is an economy growing faster or slower in that year than in some uh, other year? Why is this a useful thought experiment? Uh, interannual variation in temperature tends to be somewhat random, right? There's a long-term trend, but about that trend, there's some randomness. Some years are hotter, some years are cooler. And we can use that randomness to think about uh, its impacts on uh, uh, economic aggregates in a way that reflects the nice micro level causal inference uh, that I mentioned on, on the previous slide. So basically, we're going to take the same causal inference approaches, we're going to apply it to the GDP data and think about across a lot of different economies and a lot of different years, uh, this thought experiment. Next slide. So we're going to do this globally. Uh, we're looking at country level outcomes. Uh, again, we don't have a lot of data if we just focus in the US. So we're going to go globally. Um, we're using uh, data on per capita GDP growth, so real uh, per capita GDP growth, uh, which we have for most countries around the world back to the 1960s. Um, so think of roughly 200 countries, roughly 60 years of data per country. Um, and then we're going to merge that with temperature and precipitation data uh, and run this thought experiment actually in the data. So um, this is going to be a panel regression that, again, doesn't try to compare Nigeria to Norway. It compares Norway to itself over time. It compares Nigeria to itself over time as the temperature fluctuates. And then we're going to try to fill in this plot on the left and say, OK, what, what does this overall response function look like? And before showing the, you the result, let's just think intuitively what we would expect it to see. So if you're in some of the coldest economies uh, in, in the world, so think Iceland, think Mongolia, um, this is on the on the so so on the x-axis here is average temperature uh, at really really low temperatures. What might we expect? Well, we might expect that these economies are actually a little bit better off in years that aren't terribly cold, right? They might benefit from a bit of warming. Take that out to the extreme. We don't produce much in the Antarctic. Part of the reason is because it's very cold, right? So you warm the Antarctic up, maybe we can produce more there. Humans are more comfortable. What happens at the other end? Very very hot. You might expect that productivity is going to fall, right? Output is going to fall. As temperatures increase, if you're in a very hot place to start, and temperatures further increase. So that would suggest a sort of hill-shaped relationship uh, between temperature uh, and output. Uh, next slide. And I primed you to uh, see this, uh, and sorry for the slightly blurry figure here. That is indeed what we see. So this is the global nonlinear response of GDP growth to temperature. Um, so again, at, at, at uh, at cold average temperatures, this thing is upward sloping. We see in the data that uh, very cold countries tend to benefit. Most countries are around the peak of this curve or are in the tropics to the right of it. And so most of the world uh, begins to be harmed as you slowly warm them up or push them to the right uh, on this plot, as I'll show you in a second. Next slide. Uh, just quickly, this thing is very robust. Again, sorry, this is so blurry. Uh, very robust to different ways of estimation. I won't spend a lot of time on this. Happy to chat. Next slide. Um, one immediate thing you might be interested in is, is adaptation. Um, and so can we study adaptation uh, in this framework? We're using 60 years of data. The, the world has gotten much richer, three to four X richer over the last 60 years, depending on how you count. Surely we've adapted. Surely we've gotten better at dealing with warmer temperatures or temperature fluctuations. An easy thing we can do in these data is actually split up the data decade by decade, or here I'm grouping them by two decades and study whether that response function changes over time. And we find absolutely no, no change in the response function. It's totally rock solid over the last six decades. So as one measure of adaptation, you might expect this thing flattening out as we become better at dealing with really hot temperatures. We see no evidence that that has happened in the historical data. Next slide. OK, last thing to look at, and then we're going to run the world forward and think about future economic impacts. Uh, we want to understand whether a hot year this year affects output or growth in output in this year, but also potentially in subsequent years. Uh, multiple previous work suggests there could be lagged effects. This has important uh, econometric implications, too, for thinking about whether we're actually picking up growth effects or, or just what we call level effects. Uh, and so we, we want to run a lagged model where heat can affect output in this year and in subsequent years. I'm going to show you these in terms of marginal effects. So uh, think back to that plot I just showed you, the hill-shaped response function. Now I'm taking the derivative of that, right? So I'm just measuring the slope of that function. If that thing is positive, that means it's upward sloping and countries benefit from a little bit of warming. If it's downward sloping, it means countries are harmed. I put the USA average temperature in here. Uh, population weighted average temperature is about 14 degrees Celsius. 
Uh, and so US is very close, if not just a little bit past the peak uh, of that plot. Um, okay, so this is, uh, this is uh, in the same year, the effects of a hot year on output in that year. Next slide. Here's uh, over two years. So in that year and the following year, and then adding up the effects. If you look closely, you can see that thing's coming down just slightly. Next slide. And we can run this up to three years or five years or even out to 10 years. The picture looks pretty similar. As you add more years, you accumulate what looks like more and more damage. So more countries have this line now that is below zero and even substantially below zero, suggesting the cumulative effects of temperature are much larger than the sort of immediate effects of temperature in a way that really matters for the calculations that we're about to do. So again, the cumulative effects, when you include these lag effects, get larger and larger the more lags you include out to about five years. And then to us, it looks like it's fairly stable at five years. Next slide. OK, so what are the implications for near-term GDP? This is a, um, the topic of today. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to take those response functions really seriously and uh, anticipate that uh, economies in the next few decades are going to respond to temperature increases just as they have in the last few decades. So we're going to run the world forward. We're going to assume a baseline growth rate. So imagine this is a, just a, we pick 2%, 2% baseline growth rate. Assume that's a no warming growth rate. And then we're going to perturb that based on that response function I just showed you. We can do this for the US. We can do it for anywhere in the world. I'll just show you results for the US. So here's the change in global temperature out to 2100 under different emission scenarios. I won't dwell on this. Let's just focus on the green one, which is the path that we think we're on right now uh, relative to today. So this is all done relative to today, 2020. Uh, we're going to warm an additional degree and a half, maybe two degrees by 2100 under this SSP3 uh, 7.0, sort of the, again, the scenario we think we're on right now. Okay, that's the temperature warming. Next slide. We're going to pump that through our response function. We can measure then the impacts on the growth rate. Uh, so uh, folks here are mainly interested in 2050. So if you go to the middle of this plot on the green line, this is our zero lag model. So this would be our more conservative model. We find uh, uh, you lose about a tenth of a percentage point uh, of annual growth rate by 2050 every year. So you're growing at a tenth of a percentage point slower than you would have been absent warming under an emission scenario that we think of as sort of business as usual right now. Okay, next slide. Okay, what does that mean for total output? So here now I just run it out to 2050. Um, that's the sort of budgetary window we're interested in. Uh, we find a number that was actually pretty close to the one Bob uh, used earlier and, and was used in the CBO. I think they used 1% by 2050. We find 1.5% uh, by 2050. Uh, again, under our most conservative estimate. If you run the lag model, you include the cumulative effects. This thing is actually four to five times larger. So it's much larger. So this would be, I think, a very conservative uh, interpretation of the results you get out of um, the GDP data if, if you take these lagged effects seriously. But this would be the number, 1.5%. Uh, last slide, and I'll, I'll finish up here. Uh, so how to integrate these estimates uh, into a longer-term budget outlook. So if we assume they're right, which of course they are, um, we think these historical data offer a, a useful empirical constraint on the relationship between growth or output uh, and temperature, right? And an empirical constraint uh, or, or, or a set of moments that uh, these models can try uh, to match. Uh, next slide. I think one thing to point out, so, so sort of two conclusions there. One thing that was uh, sort of pointed out or worried about in the very nice OMB a CEA white paper on this that Fran mentioned earlier uh, is if it's the case that temperature has already slowed productivity growth in the U.S. and future budget outlooks are based on historical slowing of TFP growth, then maybe climate is already sort of baked in to our estimates. Uh, our data would suggest that's not true. The U.S. has been right at the optimal temperature, and so at least historically had not been affected, but will be affected as future temperature increases push it off that optimum. So our data would suggest that the TFP slowdown, uh, at least in the, in the GDP data, is, is not a result of, of warming uh, in the US specifically, but will be uh, in the future. So projections that reflect the slowdown are not already baking in climate impacts is my main point. Um, and the recommendation here uh, is again, and I think very close to what folks are doing right now, which is great. Um, so take your preferred model uh, with, TFP or with factor-specific productivities, 
um, and adjust those productivity such that the model output actually matches the empirical constraints that we see uh, in the data. And if I understand uh, Bob uh, earlier, it sounds like this is very close to what the CBO is doing. Um, and I think that's great. I think that would be a, a nice way to integrate these estimates. So I will stop there and, and hand it off. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you, Marshall. Um, now I'm going to introduce Tama Carlton, who's an assistant professor at the Brent School of Environmental Management, uh, Environmental Science and Management at UC Santa Barbara. And Tama's research combines economics with remote sensing, data science, and climate science to quantify how environmental change and economic development uh, shape one another. Thanks, Paul. Um, thanks so much for the invitation to be a part of this event. Um, as Marshall said, I'm going to focus on the bottom-up approach to measuring climate damages and with a particular lens on how that approach and some of the new empirics that we've been working on shed light on the inequalities of climate change. Next slide, please. So we all think about climate change as a global phenomenon, of course, um, but we don't experience climate change in the form of global mean surface temperature or global sea level rise. We're experiencing these impacts at a local level and often in the form of extreme events, perhaps no better example than the Pakistan floods uh, that, that hit last summer. Next slide. But these local level effects, of course, manifest very differently around the world. While Pakistan was getting these floods, the southwestern US was getting hit with a series of heat waves. And the actual welfare effects of those two events look very, very different, despite both being uh, driven to some part by this global phenomenon of, of warming. Next slide. So accurately capturing these local level damage estimates in a sector specific way can be really important for climate policy in two different ways. So one, we're not going to be getting the aggregate climate damage estimates correct if we ignore the fact that there are very differentiated effects across heterogeneous populations. And then the other is that as we're building plans for adaptation looking forward, we need to have accurate estimates of what's going to happen in a sector specific manner on the ground in a given locality. Next slide. So as Saul mentioned, um, a lot of the, the work that we all here are contributing to sort of built out of early global climate damage assessments that um, were very influential, but gave us estimates like three degrees of warming is associated with the losses globally of about 1.3%. Um, this gave us one sort of aggregate number across sectors and across locations around the world. Next slide. But where the frontier is sort of moving now is much higher spatial resolution that allows us to really dig into inequality in a way that wasn't possible before. So these are six examples from work um, by collaborators at the Climate Impact Lab, where we're measuring climate damages for each of these sectors at the scale of about 25,000 different regions around the world. Next slide. It's not just us, so what I want to, I'm of course going to talk about our work at the Climate Impact Lab throughout um, this talk, but I want to point out that a variety of different scholars working with very different toolkits are also working to increase the spatial resolution of these estimates to start building a much more comprehensive understanding of inequality under climate change, whether you're using spatial equilibrium models like you're seeing on this slide or the type of bottom up empirical approach that I'll highlight through the rest of the talk. Next slide. Another important um, a uh, sort of feature of the new era of climate damage estimation, as Saul pointed out, is its empirical foundation. So on the left is a histogram of the dates of publication of empirical papers behind the original IAMs going into the original U.S. social cost of carbon. And on the right, you're just seeing evidence of an explosion of empirical work in this space. And this is the type of empirical work that we think can and should be brought into both bottom-up and top-down damage estimations. Next slide. Another feature is our ability to integrate probabilistic projections. So this means thinking both about statistical uncertainty, but critically about climate uncertainty, both in terms of the total magnitude of warming we're likely to see by looking at, at an ensemble of climate models, and that's on the x-axis on this graph, but also the spatial distribution of that warming. So each climate model is going to have slightly different projections about who's going to face what climate. And when we're thinking about inequality, getting a probabilistic sense of local level uh, warming is critically important. Next slide. And then the last feature I want to highlight in terms of where this literature is at is um, using that empirical data and those empirical approaches to capture differential vulnerabilities. So we're thinking about differential abilities of populations around the world to adapt to the exact same climate event. Here you're seeing mortality risk on the y-axis against daily temperature and recovered dose response functions for two very different places, Oslo, Norway, and Accra, Ghana. And just the differences in those curves and in those temperature distributions shows us that if we kind of ignored that heterogeneity, we 
with something like a global average response function, we'd be pretty dramatically mischaracterizing projected effects of climate change in these two localities. Next slide. So I think these sort of innovations leave us is in a position to really transform the way that climate policy is particularly treating equity. So we can build climate damage estimates that are empirically grounded and globally representative, accounting for that differential vulnerability in different populations and characterizing and valuing uncertainty. This will be important for like aggregate metrics like the SEC, but also when we're trying to specifically think about equity as part of the climate policy problem. Next slide. So what I'm gonna do is talk, sort of give a window into how we're doing this type of work at the Climate Impact Lab. And then I wanna wrap up with um, just some thoughts on some of the challenges of the bottom up and sector specific approach. Marshall already pointed to a few of them, but, um, but that's sort of where I'll end. Next slide. So um, this bottom up approach basically means that we're gonna be going sector by sector, constructing empirical estimates of climate damages using a lot of the same tools that Marshall just highlighted, generating projections for each sector, and then pulling um, those together into an integrated analysis for something like a social cost of carbon or even just an aggregate estimate of damages at a given time period. Next slide. So I'm gonna start by looking at mortality and then I'll sort of point to some results from across different sectors that we've studied. Next slide. So this is a you know empirical approach. So we're going to start with data collection. We, um, in the case of mortality, have mortality records for about 55% of the global population. This type of data collection will look the same in other sectors like energy or labor, et cetera. Next slide. We then build empirical dose response functions, just like you saw. This sort of looks like an upside down version of Marshall's graph, where we see mortality risk elevated under cold and um, heat conditions, particularly for the elderly population. Next slide. We then capture this idea of differential vulnerability by allowing that curve that you just saw to vary across space based on conditions in each location. So for example, we find that in the coldest regions of the world that are highlighted on the left, the effect of a hot day is very extreme because people are not prepared for the excess heat that they're gonna get on that day. In contrast, in the next slide, when we move to the hottest regions of the world, we see that the effect of a hot day is much more muted because these are populations that have adapted to that climate. Similarly, on the next slide, we wanna allow for economic resources to influence the shape of that curve. So it's not just that people are adapted to their climate, but it's also that um, levels of income in a given population can facilitate adaptation through lowering sensitivity of mortality, for example, to heat, and that's what we see in the data. Next slide. So that type of analysis that empirically looks at how mortality risk and temperature look, uh, that relationship varies across space and time can be used to construct these type of location specific dose response functions that capture het heterogeneity and therefore inequality in a way that hasn't been done uh, in the past. Next slide. And we can pair that with climate model projections to build estimates, for example, here you're looking at end of century of climate change damages to a given sector, accounting for the fact that different populations are differentially able to respond. The map is showing you the average, but then you know the value of this probabilistic approach is that for each of those locations, we're recovering a full um, distribution of projected impacts. Next slide. What we're seeing sort of systematically across these sectors is that these impacts are highly unequally distributed around the globe, although the spatial patterns look um, somewhat distinct. So on the next slide, we can see that mortality damages, um, next slide, please are born primarily by today's global poor. That's what you're seeing on the left. But on the right, you can see that the adaptation spending we estimate to be um, uh, to be expended in order to protect against mortality risks, you see that that is born more by today's uh, wealthiest populations. A very different pattern emerges on the next slide for agriculture, where we see that the losses are actually greater in the world's bread baskets, which are more temperate and generally wealthier, which creates a very different pattern of inequality relative to mortality risk. On the next slide, we can see that in the case of labor, the inequality really falls along sectoral lines. So it's the workers who are spending their time in agriculture, mining and construction industries where they're exposed to the climate, where they're really um, suffering effects on their labor supply and therefore disutility of working under extreme conditions. And then on the next slide in energy, again, we see that income is really critically important. So we find that for the vast majority of the global population, people don't have the resources to increase energy expenditures in response to extreme temperatures. And so we're really not seeing effects on the energy system in these places. It's really isolated to wealthy places on the right um, of the slide. Uh, next slide. So um, this is 
sort of evidence of the, or sorry, examples of that bottom-up approach. But of course, we often want to pull that together to build aggregate estimates of damages. One way of doing that is the social cost of carbon, the monetary value of damages that are caused when we release one additional ton of CO2. So next slide, I want to talk about how we can integrate that um, extreme amount of spatial heterogeneity into the FCC calculation. So I won't get into the weeds here, but the basic idea is that we can compute a spatial certainty equivalent damage function that, that basically when we aggregate damages across space, we're gonna place higher weight on the damages that accrue to poor regions where every dollar is worth more in terms of, of its marginal utility than it is in a wealthy place. And by comparing the damage functions on the screen, you can see that the one on the right that accounts for that inequality um, leads to much more damages relative to the level of consumption than when we ignore that inequality. And on the next slide, we can see how that manifests for, uh, for the SEC in that comparing the first column to the third column with versus without this accounting for equity can really dramatically change these aggregate estimates of damages. Next slide, I'll wrap up quickly. Um, so one key feature I wanna point out that sort of relates to, to Marshall's presentation is that I think this approach that the bottom-up approach is showing us that non-market damages are a really important component of aggregate damages of climate change. If you look at just the blue bars on the right of the screen, these are our sector-specific estimates of the social cost of carbon. And you can see that labor and mortality, which are the two non-market components of our STC so far, are really dominating the overall number. And that's true in our work at the Climate Impact Lab, but also on the next slide, you can see that it's true in other work as well. For example, Renard et al.'s uh, new paper on the FCC last year that shows, again, that mortality is a really important component of the aggregate number, just meaning that we need to pay a lot of attention to non-market damages. I see Saul is standing up, so I'll wrap up really quickly. Um, on the next slide, I just have a couple challenges I want to um, highlight in how we are going to build these sector-specific damages into aggregate damage metrics. I think the first is how we do monetization, converting from physical units to monetary units. Um, we know that that's going to depend really critically on strong assumptions. In the next slide, Marshall already mentioned this, the dealing with feedbacks and interactions. It's tricky in a bottom-up approach in general, but particularly when a lot of these damages are non-market. And then finally, I think that um, migration is likely to be really important in characterizing location, the next slide, sorry, um, location-specific, sector-specific damages. And I think this is a really tricky problem that we're still actively working on. Um, thanks so much for your time. I'm sorry for using a little extra. Excellent. Thank you, Tama. Uh, our third and final speaker uh, is here in person with me. Uh, Jeremy Martinich is uh, the chief of the climate science and impacts branch within the EPA. Uh, and the branch's work includes developing indicators tracking the observed effects of climate change, developing the climate science and economic analyses supporting EPA regulation and according to the CIRA project, a collaborative modeling effort to quantify and monetize the impacts of climate change in the US. <clears throat> Thank you, Saul. Thank you for the invitation. Um, Marshall and Tam are very hard acts to follow, so I will try my best. Um, so we heard top-down global econometric analysis. Um, uh, we next heard uh, from Tam uh, bottom-up global analyses uh, across a number of different sectors. And so I'm going to come down to the US and talk a little bit about some of our modeling at EPA, uh, specifically focused on bottom up modeling uh, in, in, in this country. So um, a lot of this work really generated about 16 years ago when Max, Maxman Marquis was being uh, um, considered in Congress. And uh, we, were, we were asked to present to a number of staff members and committee members at that time of what can you tell us about the tools that we can just sell to our constituents about you know describing the benefits of this rule and we worked a lot with integrated assessment modeling community and cge models at that time and when we would talk about you know changes in productivity or consumption or gdp um, or this new concept of the social cost of GHGs that was just hitting the street they were like no 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 no, no. we don't want any of that we, we want to be able to tell our farmers or our public health practitioners, like how their lives are going to be benefited as a result of this rule. And that got us down this path, um, you know, many years later that we now have with the CIRA project, which is, if you can go to the next slide, something we have at EPA, uh, yep, uh, to uh, quantify climate impacts. It's a lot of bottom-up process-based modeling to look at a large uh, a swath of the ways in which climate impacts human health, our infrastructure, ecosystems, um, you know, really the intention is to be as comprehensive as possible. It's certainly not comprehensive. Um, the problem with this approach is that 
uh, every time you have a new set of questions, you're dealing with lots of modeling teams um, and it takes a long time to rerun everything. And so we tried to develop a, next slide please, uh, a reduced form, reduced complexity version of the CIRA project and we call that Freddy. Um, this is a framework that we're currently uh, actively in, in, in um, working to uh, further build out and further apply. It has a number of sectors that I will show to you in a second. Again, this uses all the detailed bottom up um, you know, very high resolution, high temporal resolution, spatial and temporal resolution modeling that you do from a from an impact sectoral modeling perspective, and using that create to create damage functions that you can then build um, and use in 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 Freddy. Next slide, please. So here's some of the sectoral coverage within Freddy. It's certainly not complete. We've worked uh, with a climate impact lab, and um, a number of those folks are here: Tama, Saul, Bob, and others. Uh, James Rising to uh, get this information uh, into Freddie. Um, we want to continue to expand this. Certainly climate impacts modeling is happening well beyond just our two groups. And so uh, we are actively, um, you know, wanting to build as much in here. There, there's a lot of coverage here, but there's a lot of these are incomplete, not only because there's some missing, but also because the ones that we have may only capture a part of the total effect. Again, this is entirely within U.S. borders, so some of these impacts are happening, uh, you know, a lot of impacts are happening globally that would have effects on U.S. interests, and those aren't captured here. Next slide. So these specific numbers are not, are, are not the point of what, what, what it, I want to show you here. It's really just the capabilities of Freddie to, to answer questions of, you know, what do total damages possibly look like for the sectors that are represented, you know, how do those map out across sectors so we can try to understand at an aggregate level or um, nationally or or regionally you know what types of impacts are occurring in different parts of the country and where may, they may be most um, significant next slide please um, again we can look at uh, the regional sectors we they, we map to the uh, seven um, national climate assessment regions shown here we're working to build that down to even finer resolutions uh, this year we can also look at uh, um, both at national and regional scales how these impacts might be distributed across different populations of the U.S. Uh, shown here are um, uh, you know different uh, populations based on race and ethnicity and the likelihood that some populations may face greater risks rather than others. Next slide, please. Um, so going back to this Freddie coverage um, example, uh, Fran, John, and Andrew Wilson in the back and others we've been working with to think about how we can use Freddie, given that it has uh, decent sectoral coverage to inform uh, a lot of the work that they described earlier. And uh, one of the things that we're running up against is that you know the, the levers that we have to connect this physical impacts modeling to, um, you know, the mouse model to other, uh, you know, broad macroeconomic models, those levers are not well established. Um, you can see that, you know, a lot of the impacts in uh, Freddie here are not, um, you know, directly re re relevant to capital or just don't have a good uh, lever to pull on. If you were observing it and you, you saw before the, the, the largest damage sectors, four of the five of those are not shown in uh, purple or red. So that's uh, meaningful. Um, that means that there's a lot of important climate damages that are not, you know, captured, would not be captured if we were to include anything right now in any economic or macroeconomic framework. Next slide, please. So I'm going to um, just talk through some some takeaways here that that first one, like I just mentioned, is that there's, you know, a lot of additional work that we need to do to, um, you know, think through these connections between physical climate impacts modeling at a sector level, and then what are the levers within these macroeconomic models that we can connect to. Um, that's something that we're doing that, that, that we're actively working on right now. Um, and, and hope to hope to be in a better position, uh, you know, in future iterations of the processes that Fran and John and others are, are leading um, in, in the White House. Um, Freddie's far from comprehensive. Um, there's a lot of impacts that are that are not included. Uh, like I mentioned, we also tend to, you know, like most physical climate impacts models, underrepresent extremes. Um, that's something that starts with a lot of the climate models that 
you know, modeling projections that we use uh, that are developed by others, and then is further um, worsened just in how we tend to, you know, focus a lot on means and, and medians um, moving forward. So that's some place that we are continuing to work on. You know, one of my things I really want to impress upon is that, and we heard this a couple times from from you know today, is that a, you know focusing on you know, national macroeconomic effects, which is obviously the whole notion of this uh, roundtable. Uh, it's really important for this community. Um, I think from an e from a kind of where I stand uh, at ADPA, I definitely see that, you know, or I'll just use an example. I don't think there's a single person in my extended family that could tell me what GDP means. Um, and most of the stakeholders that EPA works with don't know either. So I think it, this this whole process would be re remiss if we go through it and we're not thinking of ways that we can use the same modeling that we're doing to look at changes in productivity and consumption, but also making sure that we're deriving endpoints from it that better connect with people because that's how the administration, that's how EPA, that's how others are needing to sell the value of what we're trying to do to reduce emissions and why it's important to people. Um, so you know, want to kind of nail that point home. Um, and, and, and finally, I'd touch a little bit, we, we are, and, and uh, Tamla's presentation was great in, in, in thinking about, and the Climate Impacts Lab has been very progressive in thinking about distributional effects globally. That's something that's really important here in the US and, and something that's really important for the EPA to, to do when we release rules is to be able to talk about, you know, how would this rule benefit, you know, those who are, um, you know, overburdened and whether it will or whether it won't. <clears throat> and uh, being a, a, a climate scientist and working in a climate science group that does a lot of climate e economics work, um, I'd be remiss in thinking that, or without saying something about, you know, in, as in the climate science world, what happens over the five next five to 10 years is not at all a time frame that we think of because climate, you know, getting that signal out of the natural variability right now is really difficult. And, you know, we are just at the tip of the iceberg. And so, um, you know, thinking beyond the next five to 10 years where we know that the rate of damages will really be ramping up is really important. So, um, you know, would encourage this, this, this group and the committee and round table to, to, to um, not, uh, you know, of course, we're going <laughs> to, when we're thinking about this budget process, we're not going to get out of the 10 to 15 year times time frame, but also to be thinking about what's coming down further down the line and implications of that. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Jeremy, for that. Um, while questions come in, um, I'll, you know, since I had two questions before that didn't get called on, I'm going to use my privilege to ask two questions real quick. Uh, for all for for the three of you, um, can you just speak for one second about the extent to which the approaches you described uh, capture adaptation uh, in ways that we might want to think about going forward? And also, we saw three different presentations, and we saw saw three different spatial resolutions. Um, and so, just given that you know this exercise that we're sort of talking about in this room is a lot of macro, to what extent does spatial resolution matter? You know, is that um, so I don't know if any of you guys want to step up to that and then I'll write down names for questions. Jeremy, Tamil, go ahead. If you want. Sure, I, I can start. Um, go oh, ahead. Sorry. Um, so on adaptation, the short answer is that adaptation is included to the extent that and in the manners that we've seen it happen in the past. So we're using historical evidence on how, say, a heat wave looks very different for mortality in Houston than it does in Seattle, um, or how electricity consumption responses to heat are differ in Delhi than they do in Florida um, to inform what we think the future will look like under those climates in the future. And so to the extent that we've seen people adapt and respond in the past, we're going to be capturing that. But to the extent that there are big technological changes or really big shifts in people's behaviors that look very different from what we've seen in the past, those, of course, would not be included because we're sort of taking this empirical approach where we're relying really heavily on the historical data to generate projections into the future. Um, and then really briefly uh, on space, I think 
Um, the short answer is that it matters a lot. So we uncover really substantial heterogeneity within country boundaries and even within something like a state um, within the US and in many other regions of the world. When we think about, say, the effect of a hot day or the effect of a cold day, um, not in addition to the distribution of those hot and cold days. And so I think um, increasing the spatial resolution it matters not just for adaptation planning, but also for getting the aggregate number correct because there's so many nonlinearities. And, and if we ignore that, there's maybe the, the total number is wrong. Great. Um, I'll, 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 I'll chime in and Thanks. say maybe first apologize that um, I'm seeing myself on a big screen here and I, I didn't uh, button my, uh, <laughs> my, my collar. Um, I think my style is still uh, uh, somewhat lost in the after effects of the pandemic. Um, but uh, so in the CIRA project, adaptation has really kind of been a start because we do a lot of process-based modeling when we, when we think and, you know, wanted to develop a model to estimate, say, uh, effects on coastal property and properties across the U.S., um, including that adaptive response was really imperative because you can't come up with a reasonable estimate without some sort of knowledge and assumption about how properties might respond to those risks. Um, they're not just going to, you know, most properties will not just take, um, you know, uh, losses and, and, and not try to do something if they can. And so, um, and that rings to, to a, a number of, a number of sectors, for example, the high tide flooding and road infrastructure analysis as roadways get more and more water on them during high tide, um, you know, travelers will not just, you know, sit and sit in line waiting for that puddle to recede, um, for six hours, they're going to, you know, punch their, um, you know, punch their uh, address into Google maps of where they're going and find out some alternative way. And so we, we, we capture all of that. Uh, in our modeling and try to. Um, so it's an important uh, piece. Just add quickly on our side, I uh, agree with uh, everything Tim and Jeremy just said. Uh, a lot of the adaptation uh, that we have seen will be baked into the estimates. So the estimates we see in the historical data will be net of many of the adaptations uh, you know, that, that people will or won't have undertaken. Uh, economics as a profession, I would say, is wildly optimistic on the ability of people to adapt. Um, I, my own read of the data is that we should be less optimistic. Uh, if we get our act together on mitigation, we are about halfway through the warming that we are likely to see by mid or end of century. So we have experienced a lot of warming and had ample opportunity to adapt. In some data sets, we see this, but we see that adaptation is slow and that it's costly. That's what TAMIS data on mortality would suggest. In the GDP data, we see very little evidence of adaptation. That response function has not flattened out over time, and it does not differ strongly by income. We can estimate it in wealthier and poorer countries, and unlike in uh, the results Tama showed, we do not see clear evidence of differential response by income, suggesting that adaptation economy-wide is not obviously uh, solving this problem. So I, I, am, I am less optimistic, uh, given the historical data on, on adaptation. Uh, great, uh, Paulina. Um, hi, thank you. Um, I guess um, the I'm, a, I'm not an economist. Um, I do energy system modeling, um, so I have like a potentially controversial statement. Um, but um. So none of the social cost of carbon estimates that are available and that I've seen in the in the literature are consistent with a 1.5 degree target, right? They're, so we either believe that we need to reach 1.5 degree, which means net zero CO2 emissions by the middle of the century to avoid catastrophic climate change, or we believe that the social cost of carbon is $100. But those two things are not consistent. Because at $100, like at $100 per ton, we're not, that does not send a signal strong enough to do mitigation to reach 1.5, right? So those two things are inconsistent, one. And so the other question is, is that like, I would argue that the true social cost of carbon is unknowable uh, as a dollar value, right? Um, you have the bottom-up models that are estimating the mortality impact and um, 
And some of those could be monetized, but there are things that we're just not going to be able to monetize. Like, how do you monetize mass extinction events? Uh, and so if the social cost of carbon is unknowable as a, in a monetary value, like how do we, first, I guess, how do we reconcile the social cost of carbon and the case and the argument that 1.5 degree is our target? Uh, and then if we don't, if we acknowledge that social cost of carbon is unknowable, where do we go from there? Thanks. Yeah, I'll just add, um, I, I, I appreciate your comments. Um, um, from an EPA perspective, um, which has been actively involved in the, in the energy space and, and advancement of um, the development of the social cost of carbon, uh, you know, I, um, I don't think there's like a, you know, particular global temperature target in mind that's driving the advancement of those estimates. I think it's, you know, looking at the science and the economics and the literature and saying, you know, what are the, what's the robust science that we can bring into the process to help quantify these damages, acknowledging that there are still tons, even the latest estimates still only include, you know, four to five sectors, uh, you know, of potential damages at, at a global level. So, um, you know, I, I think it's an iterative process and, 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 and an imperfect process, but one that, you know, takes time to, to develop. Um, I'll just clarify concepts a little bit. So just to be really clear on the definition of the social cost of carbon, at least as far as we're interpreting and using it, um, it's the benefits of reducing a ton of CO2. And if that's going to be used in policymaking, the idea is that you then compare those benefits to the costs of achieving that emissions reduction. And so this isn't, um, you know, it can be used to assess a proposed policy and, and um, determine whether it's cost effective or not but it is not as a concept designed to pick an optimal target. It can be used in a broader model that models both sides of that equation, both the cost and the benefits to derive an optimal uh, level of warming and something like an optimal carbon tax. But by definition and the way that it's used in the United States, it is not necessarily tied to any type of optimal target number wise or in terms of warming or, uh, or a carbon tax. And then I think um, on the point about it being unknowable, I mean, I think there's probably some like philosophical uh, discussions to be had about how you think about numbers that are difficult to, to quantify. But I think Jeremy's totally right that what we've been continuing to see over the last few decades of work in this space is that as we um, improve our knowledge in existing sectors and add sectors in general, we see that the number is rising. That's not true in all cases. For example, our energy numbers are negative. Um, but I think it's it's really critical to continue to improve and update it as opposed to, um, to not provide quantitative numbers um, of these uh, estimates if we think that there are certain categories that are going to be more difficult. Uh, Lori? Can I follow up quickly um, on that definition? I'm give uh, a chance to the other questions. OK. That's OK. Thanks. Lori? Hi, you guys. This was so interesting. I am learning so much today. And I'm going to sound like a broken record, but as the population person, I want to ask about population again. So, Tammy, you mentioned um, migration as a first order problem, and that is that's so interesting to hear. And you mentioned you're starting to think about it. I would love to hear what that start looks like. And then, Jeremy, I was wondering, you know, um, migration is a form of adaptation. So I wonder if it if it shows up in the EPA's work at all. And then I was super curious about suicide. Suicide showed up on your list of um, uh, inputs at some point where, um, how did that, I, I, how did that rise to, to that level of importance? I'm just really curious. Thanks so much. Jeremy, I can take migration really quickly and then pass off to you. Um, yeah, to be clear, I'm, I'm not an expert in this space. I just see it as a, a really important unknown and, and a sort of under um, studied and, and not sufficiently integrated in a lot of particularly the bottom up estimates of aggregate climate damages. So the reason that I think this is difficult is that um, migration is there can be forces from climate change that are either pushing migration to happen um, or pulling people back and holding them from migrating. And so it's a really complicated 
data generating process and one that gets really complicated when all locations are getting warm, warmer and suffering changes in precipitation patterns at the same time. And so I think some of the tools that we've been using to empirically characterize other sectors and other responses are gonna be very difficult to port over to this problem. So there's a lot of work in this space um, showing us that there's many different heterogeneous migratory responses to climate change, but how we build that literature into these types of macro global scale models of where we think people are gonna go when, I think that's, um, that's really challenged going forward. I'll continue on that by saying that, uh... You know, like I said before, the, uh, CIRA is very much just looking inside of EPA uh, in U.S. borders, and so um, what's not included in that is is the effects of you know global impacts where it could, it could lead to migration to the U.S. Um, and that's you know a huge um, that would be in, 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 have an enormous impact that we certainly our project has no ability to quantify. Um, we have looked at migration, the effects of migration just within the U.S., where you know there might be places that are more inhabitable, or 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 how climate will interact uh, with existing migration changes happening today. You know, pushes towards ur urbanization and so forth. Um, and what we found is that um, a lot of the top tier, including one of EPA's um, the, the ICLUS model. Um, the gravity models within these migration models suggest very different things and very different patterns. And so the uncertainty was so large across these models that we've, we sort of decided to, um, you know, stick with median cases and not kind of add that additional dimension of uncertainty, even though we know it's probably really important, um, especially since a lot, in the, a lot of what we do in the project is, particularly when we talk about changes in um, risks to different populations, a lot of that's, well, well, who's living in that area in 2090 that we're projecting the impacts to. And so um, it's, it's a, you know, it, I think a, a very important area that there's it, it advancements to help us understand. Um, on the suicide piece, um, this is, I, I actually know that Marshall and I think Saul have done some work on this. So they, they're probably in much better spaces to, 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 to answer this question, but I'll just say, um, we, we recently completed a, a, an analysis and, um, you know, looking at, you know, what the effects of extreme heat on, um, on, on suicide incidents, um, and it's very meaningful. I know, I think Marshall and Saul, maybe you guys have done work more at a global level. Is that right? Or I, I can't remember. Sorry. Yeah, we've looked in the U.S. and Mexico. Tama has a paper in India. I think what's relevant to suicide and what distinguishes it maybe a little bit from the other mortality outcomes that Tama showed is you see a very different, quote unquote, dose response function. So uh, Tama shows that, and this is, you know, classic, you see more mortality at really cold temperatures and really hot temperatures. For a few specific outcomes, suicide, homicide, car wrecks, um, we don't see that relationship. We see what looks like a linear upward sloping relationship. And so that has very different implications for warming than the perhaps cardiovascular driven response to extreme temperatures that really dominate the, the sort of population health temperature mortality response that Tama saw. So uh, Jeremy, I was actually, yeah, also interested in, and sort of glad you had it up there as a separate thing, because I think we, it, it might respond a little bit differently, especially if baseline rates are changing in a way that's differential from cardiovascular. So we've seen suicide rates go up 25, 30% in the last two decades in this country. And, and so the baseline rate is changing in a way that, that matters for future impact. Thank you all, it's really interesting. Thank you. Uh, Eric. Thank you. <laughs> I didn't mean. I didn't mean to do that. Let me do this microphone. Hi, thank you. Um, so uh, this is for Marshall. Uh, when you were presenting your results about um, the multi-year impact of a, uh, a one-year dry, a one hot year, I mean, um, some, some climatic events happen in clusters over multiple years. And I would think that uh, a sequence of hot years or what we've seen more often is a sequence of drought years would have a different impact um, than simply a sequence of one year, uh, one years separated by some gap. Um, are you able to look at that? Have you looked at that? Thanks. 
Thanks, Eric. Great question. Uh, short answer, no. The results I showed you there uh, assume sort of additive separability, right? That the years don't interact. They just sort of add up. Um, and so to the extent they do and those amplify impacts, then uh, that's not in our results. So that is an important empirical question. I don't know that anyone has done this yet in the GDP data, so it's an important, I'm going to write that down as something we should do. So thanks. Uh, Sarah, did you have your hand up? Yeah, I want to go back to something that Jeremy said that I wanted to allow you to clarify since this is also put in public comment. You said for at a five to 10 year level, it's not possible to understand the signal out of the natural noise of climate change um, for events, whereas we have probabilities showing the probabilities and magnitudes of events are increasing and are very much detectable right now. So can you clarify what you meant there? Yeah, just that there's... Um you know, the, the, the effect of warming and perturbing the climate system is, um, you know, influenced by natural variability occurring today and that will continue. Uh, but that warming signal becomes more clear over time. And so um, not that plus the, um, the fact that, you know, the difference in emissions between policy cases and reference cases take time to show up in the climate system because of delays in the climate system, right? Like there's, you know, um, you know, the greenhouse gases are very long lived and, and, and um, have, uh, you know, lasting effects on our climate system. So when we look at damages and impacts in, in the climate impacts world, we tend to focus on timeframes of 2050, 2070, 2090, you know, end of century, many decades out. And if someone wanted to know, you know, typically climate scientists would be more unsure answering questions of, you know, what are sea level rise damages in 2026 going to be different than what they are today? I think most climate scientists would 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 have um, some some concerns at, at, at tweaking that out. That said, there's a lot of other people in this room who could probably answer that question um, either better or add to that than me. Uh, Dubé online. Yeah, I'll clarify your answer. And that is there's natural variability and that is phase. So Sometimes natural variability is in phase with the secular trend, and sometimes it's not. But the aggregate effect is you don't know, right? You can't predict that. So you have to assume that if it, you know, like the El Nino La Nina cycle, which is now going to be, if there's a La, uh, El Nino, which will now be worse for the US. So I think that's an important nuance, but I think we do know that the uh, secular signal is now bigger than the. Uh, natural variability. That is kind of the consensus in the science community. So I think what we should be clear. Let me, so I'm a climate scientist. Uh, I'm a measurement person and even climate modeling is very hard, right? And so the way we dissect the problem is I call it case studies, right? The, and, and the case studies we use are natural variability. So whenever there's some event uh, or a phase change between nature and, and, and secular finding, we try to probe it and dissect it by simplifying the case. So in your impact, human impacts scenario, I can see examples, like right? For example, Hurricane Katrina had a devastating effect. That's a case study that can calibrate in the US the models. There's this whole issue of people still moving to live in Arizona, right? Despite all the water stresses, people still moving to the West Coast. It's very different in other countries where extremes hit and you have no choice. Right in America, you still have resources and choices. So these are the case studies. I know we have a framework; it's hard, but I think the more and this is happening in the climate community. So I presume and I'm not an expert in your field, but the same thing needs to happen more, so you can get more robust, disaggregated, segregated cost, uh, you know, cost functions or, or or loss functions for all these things. So I, this is just my approach. This is new to me, but I think this is where. Actually, the climate scientists have the same dialogue. So the language is very similar, the fields. But I think we are a little bit more mature, right? We don't wait for warming for another two degrees C. We see for oscillation, the La Nina cycle, for example. And then we probe the carbon climate feedbacks. 
and, and you need to do, this, do the same with people, right? So it's a very analogous system. Uh, uh, so I just had to say that uh, and, and get your thoughts. I mean, you, you're probably earlier in the game. Climate science is what, 25, 30, 40, 50 years old since Keeling. But, but you, guys, you guys are near us in Nordhaus. I mean, you're, and you're, you're generally coarser. You won't have enough. So case studies, calibrations, contrasts will be very important. Thank you. Anyone want to Mark respond? Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I really love that that question. I think you're you're right, both that we're younger as a discipline, but also that there's a lot of um, analogous conceptual frameworks behind what we're doing. I think um, essentially you can think about a lot of our statistical modeling as uh, investigating many of those types of case studies in a larger data set and and pulling out statistical relationships from seeing many different heat events in a Chicago summer or many different cold events um, in, in, in Northern Europe. Um, but I think you're also right that as climate change continues to progress, you know, the, the benefit of that on the researcher side is getting more of those case studies or those you know, observations in our data set out at the tail ends of some of these distributions to begin to parameterize parts of these curves that we have to take out, out of sample into the future. And so, you know, Marshall does really exciting work on wildfire. And the more that we're seeing these events, the more data we have to begin to build up a systematic understanding of those case studies, particularly at the edges of our distributions where um, we really need to parameterize carefully when we think about long run futures. Uh, Tim. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Tim Lenton, climate scientist in the UK. Point of information, uh, surrounding sea surface temperatures are about four sigma above the mean for June at the moment, and we're sweltering here. So I would love to hear, uh, saluting all your great work, I'd love to hear your thoughts on how we can push the frontiers of uh, assessing the extremes and their impacts. Um, but also, and I hope I'm not repeating Sol's original question, I know, I take the point that we're not seeing necessarily evidence of adaptation within the econometric analysis, but to what degree are you using this, or is anyone using this um, rapidly advancing impact assessment to guide adaptation, um, proactive adaptation policy or intervention or spending of money to uh, alleviate some of those impacts? Thanks. I could start just quickly by saying, Tim, I think exa that's exactly the right question. I don't know yet who's using these estimates to guide adaptation. I hope they do. I think this is in addition to contributing to what the CBO, CBO or CEA is going to do on the budgetary side. I think understanding impacts and indeed understanding impacts of extreme events, which I think uh, Tam's group is actually doing a really good job of doing. We're looking at historical extremes, which might not be extreme in future climates, but they're absolutely looking at extreme events and, and measuring impacts on mortality and other outcomes. So I, I think to some extent that, you know, they are doing that pretty extensively. Um, but you're absolutely right. I, you know, this should inform uh, budget. It should inform our, uh, our ambition on the mitigation side, but it should absolutely inform adaptation priorities, right? Because if we're seeing deaths, it means we're not adapted. And so we need to get our act together. Who, who's actually doing that? I don't know. Jeremy? <laughs> Yeah, I can take that a little bit. Um, you know, I, again, we we approached the adaptation questions because, and we knew we knew we needed to include adaptation because we needed those assumptions in order to have robust estimates for purposes of determining climate damages. Um, but when we had those estimates, a lot of people would approach us of like, oh, we want to understand like what climate change means for how much money we're gonna to need to repair highways and roads in the US or for coastal damages and our coastal you know, flood insurance programs. And it was like, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Like that's, that's not the analyses we did. Like we didn't do like a, you know, what does climate change mean for the flood insurance program? Like, I, I don't know if I feel comfortable like reformatting that program based on our estimates um, at all. So, um, you know, and I was actually just speaking um, an hour ago to someone in the room about how, you know, a lot of these, there, there's just not a lot of estimates out there um, for a lot of these different sectors. And so I think that's a, an, an additional call to action of how we need to advance that 
side of it, a lot of the damage quantification has been sort of more geared towards how do we describe climate damages rather rather than what are the economics of adaptation and um, and and so there you know that should be a you know I think an outcome of this this workshop is a recommendation to really advance that. Rachel. Yeah, thank you. This has been just really a wonderful session. Um, I just wanted to circle back to the question uh, Sarah asked because the, the, there is a clear signal already and the signal is relative to the baseline. You can use say the NOAA has their most recent 30 year climate normal baseline. It's not about 2026 versus today. It's about the fact that already today we've warmed a little over a degree Celsius and there's a very clear climate signal. And the attribution science is solid, right? And it's getting better all the time in the last 10 years. There's now rapid attribution when you have these extreme events like the Pakistan floods or heat waves. So I, I think especially for an audience like this, it's really important uh, to be crystal clear that uh, the signal is there and um, the, the science is, is making the connections uh, very clearly between events that are happening already around us. Um, the, the question I have uh, for Marshall and Tama is, uh, you know, I know you have to rely on data sets in the past, but we know going forward that there are significant non-linearities that uh, the climate science is showing are likely to be the case. So the last one degree Celsius increase in temperature is, is going to look like child's play compared to the next degree Celsius rise in temperature. Every fraction of a degree from here on out is more consequential uh, in many ways, including um, to the economy, but certainly to people's health. So how can we make sure, even though we can learn some important lessons from past data, that we're not getting overly anchored? We're already seeing that the insurance industry, it's the canary in the coal mine, right? It's already showing that the past is not a good predictor of the future. And then finally, we have this mismatch where while you while it might be true that in the next five years, uh, we see significantly worsening impacts, but they're still not as bad as say mid-century. But we know from the IPCC reports and a whole body of science that these next five to 10 years are the critical years for the actions we can take to stave off some of those worst impacts. So how can we make sure that we don't have this policy mismatch, that we're waiting for the bad stuff to happen before we act because we say it's not happening in the next five years. But that is our window to do a lot of things, not just on mitigation, but also on resilience. Um, and how can we collapse that future into the present? Because that's what, if we have good information and we can bring that information uh, into market incentives and policy incentives now, we can create that future, right? Where there isn't that mismatch in time horizon. So curious what you all think about the potential to do that through this workshop and others. Go for it, Tama. You can start. Uh, thanks, Rachel. Uh, super important points. So uh, we should think about two different types of nonlinearities, nonlinearities in the response of the climate system to forcing and then nonlinearities in social systems in response to climatic change, right? And I think you're absolutely right that we need to be able to quantify both of those things. Uh, we're going to leave the, as economists, we're going to leave the first one of the climate science folks. And so it's their job to figure that stuff out. Our job is to not screw up then uh, our estimates of what's going to happen to the world, given those nonlinearities, right? And I think you're absolutely right that we're seeing evidence right now that uh, past is not going to be guide to future. So wildfires is one thing in California. You, you can't help but study if you're a scientist in this area. Uh, and we've seen just in the last month just a complete unraveling of the insurance market uh, in in California, in response to wildfires, you basically the main insurers are leaving the market. It's just it's too risky, um, and and so that that I think goes to your point. Um, and so that's one example of of where it's going to be hard to really study the past well and and say smart things about the future because it's changing really quickly. I, I think in other settings, I, I don't think we should be so pessimistic. So I think in the mortality temperature response, right? We've seen a lot of pretty extreme events historically. Uh, and we have a lot of mortality data around the world that Tama and colleagues have put together to allow us, you know, pretty good insights into what those extremes are going to look like. And climate science has studied this a lot. So I, I think in some settings, we, we shouldn't throw up our hands and say we don't have any evidence on what the future might look like. But 
in, in the wildfire case and another really rapidly changing new climate impacts, I, I do think you're right that uh, historical data are, are not a great guide. Um, I'll just jump in on a couple of points. I agree with everything uh, Marshall said, and I think what, what can be really critical there is finding sort of the intersections in today's um, distribution of outcomes that allow us to think most responsibly about the future. So for example, in a lot of our projections, we're thinking about places getting a lot hotter, but also likely also benefiting from substantial economic growth. So if we don't have data in places that are both hot and wealthy, it's a lot harder for us to reliably make those projections about what the future may be. And so just A, working really hard to collect representative data, which has improved a lot in the last few years, but also being really transparent about when we're having to rely on out of sample versus um, you know, having experienced some of those events in the past and having, um, having more data to support that. Um, and then on your second point about um, you know, urgency of the present moment and not always focusing on projections in 2075 and beyond, I think that's a really important one. Um, on the one hand, just the construction of these dose response functions that we're talking about already begin to shed light on the damages of climate variability today. And maybe we could do a better job in our field of, of, of communicating what that means, but just the fact that we recover, you know, Marshall's inverted U is giving you insight already into what happens when we get an exceptionally hot year in a tropical country right now, um, even before you start projecting things forward. And then I do think that the related to the prior question, the science of um, impact attribution needs and should be given a lot more attention and time. And I know people in this room are actively working on it, but um, we can take some of the approaches you're seeing today and also present results for how damaging climate change has already been for mortality, for labor, for energy. Um, and that just isn't as developed as, of a science as some of the future projections that we've been doing. And I think that's um, important for, for our community to know. All right, we have two minutes left, uh, James. Really interesting panel. This is a question mainly for Jeremy, but I uh, would welcome other people's thoughts as well. There's already been some discussion in here about uh, the relative benefits of bottom-up versus top-down econometrics. Um, a lot of the results in Freddy are instead process-based models. There are strengths and weaknesses to all three of these approaches, and in addition, uh, the approach of exploitation. How, given that that Freddy has sort of uh, such an incredibly comprehensive or, or you know approaching comprehensive uh, representation of uh, all of these, how is the EPA or, or your group thinking about combining the strengths and weaknesses of these different techniques to get at a better sense of best estimates? It's a great question. Um, I think our first objective is just to characterize and include as many different impacts of climate change in Freddie as possible, right? Like we're trying to cover the, you know, as much as we can. And so there are both econometric and, you know, and process-based models within Freddie. Um, there also needs to be intentional overlap, right? So, you know, there are, I think, one or two instances where we actually have an econometric approach to a, a specific impact. And for that same impact, also have a process bottom up. And so having those differences is really important and something that we need to further build out, right? Like just because I showed those 20 sectors, it doesn't mean that um, I wouldn't want to um, have, you know, like that, that, that therefore, you know, for road infrastructure, we're done you know, and, and we don't want any more, like, no, that's the exact opposite. Like if there are other road infrastructure studies, send them to us and we'll build them, build them in. And so, um, but for, as for like deep, I think part of your question is like an, d more deeper dives into looking at the relative differences and, and, and structural differences between them. Um, it, it, it's not frankly something that we have a lot of bandwidth to do within, within Freddie, but it's something that's imp important for us to do. Um, and we just haven't gotten to as much unfortunately. All right. Well, uh, we are at time. Uh, so thank, thank you to the speakers. Um, and uh, what's our, what are we doing next, Bridget? Yeah, so we're opening the Slido one more time so people can add their ideas. If you do have to hop off, I just want to say that, well, first of all, it's been an amazing workshop. I've heard a lot of really great conversations and presentations. Um, and for tomorrow, we're convening at 930. Um, so rather than 10 at 930 tomorrow. Um, but otherwise, yes, um, I'm happy to let you all discuss and add your ideas to Slido.